When I began meditating, one of the first things that I noticed was this sort of acute sense of body consciousness or body awareness. Um, well, actually, the first thing you notice is how impossible it is to sit still and not let your constant play of thoughts drive you insane. <laughs> um, but once you manage to slog your way through all that, it, it can take a very long time. Um, but once you sort of manage to at least put the outside world into a state of sort of abeyance or into uh, you set it aside or whatever, you manage to sort of, I don't know, isolate yourself from the outside world, uh, something else replaces it, and that's a powerful sense of body consciousness. You become aware of every little distraction involving your body. For example, if I, where I live, there's a lot of mosquitoes. You go outside to a nice place, uh, sit down, um, close your eyes, listen to the noise around you, however much or little there might be, and um, next thing you know, you've withdrawn inside of yourself. A mosquito lands on your, I don't know, in my case, my ear or my top of my head, and next thing you know, the concentration is gone. Um, but is it, though? <laughs> concentration on, on what? Concentration on things fully cerebral or concentration on the inside of your body or the experience of being inside your body. Um, you start to notice all kinds of things like the direction that your muscle tension works in. Yeah, as I say, I have repetitive strain injury and on, in this shoulder. It's not bad or anything. It's just more of an annoyance than anything else. But I notice that um, because this, th these muscles here in my rotator cuff have all kind of seized up, there's a channel of force, I guess, uh, a muscle expert, I guess, would say, uh, pulling all my muscles towards this point. In other words, the muscles of my back and my chest and my lower arm are all being sort of pulled by the tension here. It's a common thing with, um, with stiff or stiffened injured muscles. The muscle seizes up and it sort of causes tension, pulls other muscles towards itself. Well, how would you describe the experience of um, being in that state? You'd talk about the direction of the force in your muscle, right? Uh, it would be the a force, uh, I don't know, a force direction, a force channel, a force, um, you know, just strictly biological, what direction your muscle is pulling. Well, if you start talking, you start using this kind of language, and you, you, you start to... You, you end up talking esoterically whether you like it or not because you're not really talking in terms of stuff that's observable. You're only talking about stuff that's experienceable. Especially if you're comparing notes with somebody else. I've dealt with this before. I think this is the origin of ideas like Hatha Yoga and um, chakras and all this kind of thing. They're simple metaphors or simple means of talking about the experience of being inside of a human body and being aware of what's happening. Um, a distinction was made yesterday in the comment of my other video of, uh, say, between voluntary and involuntary things. Well, we all know that the advanced yogi says that nothing is ultimately involuntary. You can learn to control every aspect of your body. Uh, that's kind of India's contribution to the physical, um, I don't know what you call it, the sports world is not so much strength or endurance or anything like that, but complete control of everything. Whatever it is that you can possibly control um, is to be controlled in Hatha Yoga or Raja Yoga or whatever. Um, and the distinction gets blurred. Um, you know, we've all heard stories. Who knows if they're true? I don't really, never investigated them, of people being able to stop their hearts or slow it down to the point where it's virtually stopped or whatever. Buried alive, stop breathing, whatever. Um, I can see how that that's possible because it's all controlled by the brain anyway, and you know you gain control of what the brain is doing, and next thing you know you've got the you've got control of the entire body, everything. Um, <clears throat> so there you have uh, what I found in um, Schopenhauer the attempt to flesh out at least or flesh in <laughs> the. Um, the idea of the intuitive inner life, and inner life not in terms of inside of your own mind, but inside of your own body. 
uh, the way you intuit everything. How would a yogi explain, like thought experiment here, how would a yogi who's been able to stop his heart explain how he does it to somebody else? <laughs> Good luck. He'd have to talk in language that is so esoteric that it would sound meaningless or mumbo-jumbo-ish. Again, that's just assuming that such things happen. But, you know, there are people who manage to control certain other things. Like, I can do that. I can flare my nostrils a little bit. I can wiggle my ears a bit. <laughs> Some people can't do that. How do you explain to somebody how you do it? <laughs> that writ large is how you would control the functioning of your supposedly involuntary uh, functions of your body. Um, that's your that's one way of describing inner life, the life that takes place intuitively, encased in the body that is a direct result of the actions of the central nervous system. Schopenhauer seems to have been close to arriving at something like this. Again, I haven't really let the whole thing sort of osmose into my mind, um, but it's a fascinating thing that he got pretty far and then seemed to choke, or perhaps he simply didn't have the intellectual or, what would you call it, cultural matrix in which you could actually pursue this idea of an inner life. Um, and this is not even to begin to talk about uh, the things that take place inside of your own consciousness as opposed to inside of your own body, but because they're both intuitive, one would wonder if they're really as separate as we might think. The physical and the mental or spir spiritual or whatever you want to call it seem to intersect in the human body. The human body is ultimately or quite explainable by science. Um, we can explain all kinds of things, the workings of the organs, the muscles, the brain, all this kind of thing. But we have yet to figure out how we intuit it to work from the center. How, or at least what actually happens when I say, I want to wiggle my pinky, and my pinky wiggles. It's been suggested that you're simply, you've already done it, and you're inventing an explanation after the fact and superimposing that upon your immediate past. Maybe. I don't know how we, how we would test that, because you're talking at the level of brute perception, aren't you? Uh, what are my perceptions and, you know, living in time and everything. Uh, it's an interesting thought, but I'm not really sure if it's if it's someplace we could go. Perhaps we could. Maybe I'm simply being as blind as I am accusing Schopenhauer of, or of not having the resources at my command to actually start talking about things like that. But as I say, we're, we're using our mind intuitively to manipulate the human body uh, a lot of the time, or all the time, really. And who knows what it, what we're capable of ultimately doing uh, in terms of manipulating your body, our bodies. Um, but as I, as I say, and as I think Schopenhauer agrees, the will and the physical universe intersect in the body. Um, I think that's what he's seeing, what he's saying. It looks as though that is the case. I'm just sort of in my infancy of this kind of thinking. Um, but because I already do yoga, um, and because I already am a fairly physical individual, and because I'm extremely curious as to how everything works, especially how I work, that's the kind of thing that I'm likely to pursue. Um, but I mentioned to Mystic, uh, Mystic of the Sands yesterday that I don't think that Schopenhauer took it to the lengths to which the Indians did. Uh, or and continue to do, and now we're starting to do it as well. You get you know a lot of Westerners doing yoga, and a lot of Westerners doing it for that particular reason. Most people, I think, do yoga be for fitness reasons, but people like me, um, I'm already pretty fit. I don't need to do it for that reason. They're, although muscles are getting stiff, um, I do it for that reason plus. I know body consciousness is inevitable result of this is an inevitable result of this, and body consciousness leads to questions. How does all this work? <laughs> um, not how does it work mechanically. How do the impulses from my brain translate into what actually happens? And what's making the decision to send those impulses from my brain to the various parts of my body? The will and the phenomenal universe seem to intersect. 
there seems to be some sort of um, axis there, some sort of, what you'd call it, uh, fulcrum between the two realms, assuming they are separate realms. Maybe they're not, I don't know. They look that way, but not necessarily. In other words, I can't intuitively lift this hat off the table it's sitting on over there, but I manage to intuitively lift my hand to lift the hat. What's the difference? Um, the fire hose metaphor I used yesterday, I still kind of like that one, uh, because it's got sort of the element of unstoppability of the human will, even though all the people that say that the will is so unstoppable that it must be stopped. <laughs> Schopenhauer seems to say so. The Buddha and Mahavira seem to say so. Um, what is it that makes the decision to stop the will? Um, Liber Module nailed that one in the uh, comment section of my previous video. Um, if Schopenhauer says everything is blind will, what's going to make the decision to try and transcend the will? <laughs> Interesting question, isn't it? And Unfortunately, as usual, I've simply raised more questions than I've attempted to answer. But um, I guess we just keep asking.